And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. Hello, everyone. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Adam Kuntz, and we're going to talk about spiritualism, spiritism, and all that crazy stuff going on, that wacky stuff going on in the 19th century. Adam, how are you? Uh, doing great, despite the weather, which is uh, bright, but extremely cold. Yeah, it's um, actually, believe it or not, 34 degrees here as we record this, okay. uh, which is... Very chilly here, but we're going to hit in the 40s today. It'll be in the 60s tomorrow. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> there was one thread of one thread of snow this year, and uh, nothing nothing came of it. So we're, I'm, we're fine. I'm glad you averted that. We're looking at uh, 15 for the high for the next several days. Well, we did have a, a water leak here at the church, possibly due to cold weather. We don't know, but we got a we got a good crew of members out uh, to dig things up, and uh, I will not tell the audience how they found where the water was. Uh, but but it is a word fitly approved method, but uh, good crew here, you know, members who are able to come out and do it. So that was good to see. So that's been our only. I'm going to call that a weather related setback, perhaps. But, <laughs> but you know, um, mild hiccup, but we made it through and everything. So anyway, yeah. So and then it'll I think just keep getting warm from here. They tell me that February weather will be uh, will be interesting. So we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But are you gonna still start? not gray like Fort Wayne? You know, you're going to plant in February. I think we got a pretty generous growing season here. I can tell you that. Yeah. And uh, the church garden just across the street. So that is, that's handy. If anybody needs to find me in the summer, (laughs) I'll probably be across the street. There you go. All right. Well, Zelwyn is not here, but we folks, he is, uh, he is okay. He is on the mend. Uh, He's just uh, not available today. So the rumors of Zelwyn's death have been greatly exaggerated. (laughs) He he could not be stopped. He has just found a good wallow, and he uh, he he refuses to leave. So, well, Adam, um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit then about today's subject. We've got a fun one here: spiritualism uh, and spiritism. Uh, let, give the audience a little bit of a preview of what that what that is. Spiritualism is definitely the broader category here, having to do with the movements and the people that we'll talk about today, who are generally involved in what the Bible would call mediums, uh, mediumship, contact with the dead, the distant, or both. And so uh, that's spiritualism as a movement. Spiritism is a subset of that that we're talking about basically for the, the readers or the, the listeners' information. Also to see how you know the same thing can turn into all kinds of different movements, codified, not codified, and so forth as they progress, spiritualism is definitely the broader category there. Right. Um, it's a phenomenon that, uh, huge in its time. Uh, we, we tend to think of 19th century Americans. I mean, even urban ones as, uh, very Christian for some reason and not quite. They're actually, um, you know, large, what we would call anti-Christian movements. And this would be one, right. one where you're trying to communicate <laughs> with the dead, extremely popular at a, local level all the way up uh, to high-ranking politicians and things like that. It's a full-blown phenomenon at this time, all the way up in the early 20th century. And people are reading books on spiritualism and spiritism, books on the paranormal. Uh, so it's a bit of a craze that happens. And and it lasts longer because these things tended to last longer in the days before true mass media. So right. it's going to be interesting uh, to see how we get there. We're going to go through a civil war, so there's going to be a, a lot of national grieving. Um, a lot more empty spots at the dinner table for a lot of American families. And so it's not shocking that they're going to want to try to hold on or to communicate with those that they've lost. So this is the America in which spiritualism is able to take hold. Right. Yeah. And the be- the beginnings of these things are, I, I, there's probably two different things we could say about this. Before we talk about historical beginnings, the The basic presupposition behind all of this is that spirit is greater than and and maybe even defiled by matter generally, 
So if you look at tombstones of practicing spiritualists in a community we'll mention later on, they will say very odd sorts of things such as, you know, uh, Olivia so-and-so passed into the spirit life on the date of her death. And that's a way of thinking where the body is something to be gotten rid of. Uh, it is something very much optional. And so that right. that basic attitude that we can see when we discuss issues like cremation or something similar is behind spiritualism, that matter is somehow defiling or certainly or limiting, limiting, limiting in a way. Yeah, yeah, right. And so once you get rid of it or when you can get rid of it, you should. And that's also what makes possible the other doctrines and practices that we're going to talk about. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk then about uh, you know, where does this come from? What are the origins here? The origins are Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put big uh, scare quotes around that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Strangely enough, yeah, because there is a there's a figure uh, who has really his own religious descendants in what's called the New Church, and the figure is Emmanuel Swedenborg, who was a Swedish nobleman who, in the 18th century, so maybe 60 to 80 years before the events that we're going to largely talk about today, had a variety of what he understood to be spirit journeys or visions that he was given of heaven, of hell, of the nature of the afterlife. And he was interpreting pretty much all of this in a in fairly triune, orthodox, Lutheran terms. And I stress terms because, of course, the substance of this or the nature of the visions given or the need to relate such visions to the world is all at the very least suspect, despite the fact that the desire to contact the dead specifically, not to be taken as he thought he was by God into these realms, but the desire to contact the dead, he specifically warns against in one of the texts where he claims divine inspiration. So that's all like off base enough to begin with, but then note that he actually says, yeah. it, if you try to do this, you're going to be possessed by a demon. Yeah. So, you know, we have to defend Swedenborg here. We fair do. is fair. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the Swedenborgians who come after him, which is going to be called the New Church, this is kind of centered in the suburban Philadelphia area in America. They're, they're not spiritualists and they don't engage in mediumship as a regular religious practice. That's going to get ignored later on, and Swedenborg will be a literary source, if not a direct, you know, intellectual or religious source for most of the other people we'll discuss. Yeah, and this is um, this is a tricky one to discuss because it butts up against other movements. So Swedenborgianism, of course, but you could also say that Rosicrucianism shares some of this with its mystical and supernatural teachings. Maybe we should do a whole episode on that. Speaking of you know Lutheran influence stuff, but yeah, we um. You know, but spiritualism and spiritism is its own thing. It develops into its own thing, and yet it does share commonalities with some of these esoteric groups. Would that be a fair? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thing totally, to call them? totally, yeah, yeah. And because even I mean, in specific settings where this becomes popular in the United States, you also have right alongside of it secret societies, especially and most frequently Freemasonry, but other right. forms of ritualism usually based on a really unusual reconstruction of the past and then right. claimed descent from or contact with that past. Not to be confused with our reconstruction of the past. Is- <laughs> correct. No, we're totally, this is 100% correct what you're getting here today. We're talking about fake stuff, fake news. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So, um, so from Swedenborg, we're going to come into a uh, part of America that has uh we'll say historically had some religious turmoil in it. Yeah, right. And that is something that will be called with less specificity uh, by Charles Finney, the burnt over district and is now known to historians of American religion as the burned over district. And that is a couple of counties in central New York, but mostly kind of your Western uh, fourth of upstate New York, extending to the PA and Ohio borders this area is the source of almost anything you can think of. Yeah, from Mormonism to the rest. Yeah, it's all there. That Americans do distinctively in religion. 
Yeah, uh, we should. We've touched on this in the Great Awakenings episode uh, or episodes, and we uh, we mentioned this a lot. And even the even the f- sort of the fluidity of the definition of that term. Do you see it as a positive or a negative one, uh, depending on how you're how you're going into it, right? Yeah. Uh, are they burned over because it was the you know <laughs> the flame of revival, or are they burned over because nothing can grow there because of that? Right. And and but actually something does grow there, namely uh, heresy. And, uh, in, and, in almost um, any form you could think of. I mean, it's really yeah. kind of, it's really quite impressive. <laughs> <laughs> in its own way. Yeah. And I mean, when this is being used, they're not talking about, you know, Polish Catholic immigrants to Buffalo. No, it is, it is some guy going into his barn and coming out with something bizarre. Correct. Yeah. And, and he's going to go tell other people whose grandparents or parents came there from New England. And they're so, going to be like, sounds cool. Yes. And they're like, hey, I know a guy who owns a printing press. And then it goes viral from there. For example. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw a movie in Utah once about that. <laughs> I mean, I, and it, it's not only a religious source of innovation. It is a source of innovation in American politics, social relationships. Women's suffrage is going to be you know, brought in under public discussion for the first time there. Um, experiments well, I think, that- I, I mean, mean you, have, you have economic experiments that come yeah. out of this. You have, I mean, other social experiments. Uh, right. I mean, this is, well, actually, this doesn't predate. This is exactly what we're talking about. I mean, you have even um, prison reform and all sorts of other things that, that begin to happen. Granted, that's a little more Pennsylvania, but we're not that far. So it's because it's because it is American or develop into what we will call American a lot of some of this doesn't seem so foreign to us. This idea that someone could just have their own sort of personal religion or personal revelations, or or that all of this innovation, which would have been very novel at the time, is now the ordinary for us. Right. Yeah. And something to understand about this particular area in its mm-hmm. let's say its prehistory before the revivals that that burn it is. New York is a place that people from New England go, uh, partly for economic reasons, but but partly also if they are some kind of religious dissenter. Because remember that large parts of New England still have state churches into the early republic. So when this is settled, this is going to be settled not just, you know, my ancestors, for example, were largely Baptists that went to this area. Um, so they don't they don't conform to a congregational state church, but also anyone else who has a strange idea. Was why Methodists take root. Yeah. 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 Methodists. um, And Vermont was something like this, but upstate New York got way more of these people and was a much larger area. So that's also partly why you're getting such concentrations of, depending on your perspective, innovation or insanity. Right. Well, you know, is is one of those negative? I don't know. I'm not decided yet. (laughs) We could use a little more crazy. I'll tell you, depending on how the cult, the cult thing works out. (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're working on it right <laughs> lands lands not cheap right now yeah <laughs> um <laughs> all right well let's talk about um okay so let's talk about the progenitors proper then who who were some of the first to really develop the spiritual ist system right and to to popularize it yeah and as i tell this story there's going to be things that sound partly like sort of ghost hunters type material partly like sort of, you know, witch of Endor material. And it, it's all it's all contained together. Well, and I think it's worth saying that the modern way that ghost hunters speak about this, I mean, this is, ghost hunting is a modern incarnation of this. Yep. Right yep. down to its vocabulary. Yep, yep. If, yep. if not outright, it's theology. Right. Or philosophy, right. we should say. Be- because that's, that's, this is exactly what happens with three sisters called the Fox Sisters who will live for a very long time. They're in the public eye for about 50 years. And these sisters, uh, what what happens in the 1840s is that they begin to hear what would probably later be described as poltergeist phenomena called at the time wrappings. So knocks, bangs. Yeah, exactly. And they're fairly young at this time. I want to say maybe 20s or uh, late teens, each of them. Um, Leah, Margareta, and Charlotte. And these spirit wrappings are not really, they're heard by the girls, but not apparently by the parents at first. And the girls uh, then begin to get communications from what is understood by the neighborhood to be uh, the spirit of a peddler. 
So this is a figure who's going to wander door to door selling whatever, trinkets, whatever. Um, a peddler who was apparently murdered and buried on the property before the Fox family lived there. So there's also this sense of um, blood crying out in the story. And the blood cries out and contacts these sisters who are peculiarly attuned to these things. They hear the rappings and they finally divine the source through contact with the spirit of the peddler. That puts the wrappings to rest and coverage of the story. Again, print is really important here. Coverage right. of the story makes the three sisters famous. Right. Our boy Horace Greeley and his New York Tribune, he's going to really take up their mm -hmm. story, I guess we would say. And then it all goes, it all goes from there. I think the first question our people are going to have is, you know, why do these stories, why does this initial story captivate America and why do they continue today? You know, there it, it's it's a participatory kind of story too, because they're going to become fig, fixtures in society because of this, and so this is almost going to become kind of a spectator event eventually. We'll talk about uh, seances and things like that later. But why do you think America becomes captivated and continues to be captivated by stories like this? Partly, it is captivated because of the power of media. I mean, Horace Greeley um, is one of the people instrumental in shifting Northern public opinion on the necessity of abolition through his newspaper. So media is incredibly powerful. And if the people in charge of the media have, you know, an openness to covering these things and not just denouncing them as say a newspaper in Massachusetts a hundred years earlier, almost undoubtedly would have done, then away we go. Who knows what new ideas we may have. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, like, you know, cause you start to think, well, where were the churches and all of this, but Aren't they sort of taken under the wing of some radical Quakers shortly after this? They are, <laughs> so well, yeah, so it's going to give them some legitimacy, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, we know we know who the real Quakers are. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think that something to always keep in mind is what you said about the degree of religious practice, and that this is going to go into the relative popularity of um, spirit rapping sessions. Um, like this, that table turnings, seances, and especially public events surrounding either the Fox sisters or the enormous number of mediums that are going to spring up in the next, you know, roughly 80 years in America, is that they are going to occupy this niche in American life that churches no longer occupy for certain groups. So, for example, they're never this whole phenomenon is never going to be in the South what it is in the North, because the North, including upstate New York and New York City and stuff, yeah, I mean, America at that time is full of what we would now think of as fundamentalist Christians. I mean that right. that's normal, but there are still, especially in the educated classes, the middle and upper classes, and especially in New England and New York. Enormous numbers of people who have a really tenuous connection to any form of Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. Well, and I think that you'll that what we're going to find, and we'll probably get to this more toward the uh, toward the end of the episode, is that America's Christianity today is actually very similar to that. That oftentimes, even for quote unquote devoted Christians, there's a very frail connection to biblical truth and to Christian yep. truth. Yeah. There are a lot of assumptions, and there are still to this day a lot of assumptions in American Christianity, or perhaps Christianity at large, right. where people um, have sort of adopted a folk version of it without much careful thinking, without much meditation, without much study. And so there is a theological system that is ostensibly Christian, but which is able to absorb a lot of what we are talking about here to its detriment. Right. Yeah. Because if they're taken under their wing by, by radical Quakers, I mean, Quakers are trying to figure out at this time if they're supposed to read the Bible or heed <laughs> the inner yeah. light. Um, right. So they're going through their own church split. And so something you find over and over and over again. <laughs> are is they that, supposed you know, to li listen to the law of God or just uh, do the gospel? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who can say? Who can say? Um, I, I think, you know, these people are 19th century, you know, kind of colonial stock Americans, they talk in Bible language. I mean, <laughs> read the Book of Mormon. But 
that's not an endorsement, but um, <laughs> but it's not an un- it's not a warning either, Adam. <laughs> Just an invitation, but, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, you know, they they talk in Bible language, but you so but you will notice that that is not filled any longer for a lot of these people, Quakers, um, people who would be described by later scholars, especially of early Mormonism, as kind of seekers. So yeah, these these folks are all kind of at least one generation away from. I go to an Orthodox Christian church regularly, probably because I have to legally in, New, in most of New England. So the Bible still permeates everything, but they're drifting. And right. this is a place, I think, it's not just that the media covers this. There is a hunger for contact. I think not just with the dead, but with the supernatural. That's not being fulfilled by, you know, building yeah. new railroads. Right. Yeah. Well said. And we'll talk more about that. We've got our first break. We'll be right back with more words we've spoken right after this. Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Adam Coons. We're talking about spiritualism, spiritism, and what was going on in America in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, well, all right, Adam, well, we talked a little bit about the origins here and kind of the first major players. So where would you like to go from, from here? I think something to note is just how popular and widespread this eventually becomes long after Horace Greeley is a major force in American media because the Civil War does nothing to make this any, you know, less popular than it was before, and in fact increases its popularity um, because you have, and there's a lot of literature on this. The the scale of death in the Civil War is not something that the American populace had ever dealt with in either North or South. So uh, the desire to contact the dead is going to heighten among, especially the group that we talked about in the last segment who have this very tenuous connection to a Christianity, which has always historically said, don't do that. Right. I mean, it's, um, so it's going to develop into, um, let's talk about it then in its kind of popular form, because I, I, I see spiritualism and spiritism, uh, as, uh, more of a, of a popular religion than something like theosophy, which is going to be a much more, for lack of a better term, serious uh, movement, uh, much more uh, academic isn't the right word, but a more developed movement. So theosophy is going to take a lot of this stuff, but it's going to also develop its own theology, philosophy. Um, It's the birth of the New Age movement, things like that. I'm not saying spiritualism was shallow, but it, it was never quite as developed, even though they did write very big books in the spiritualist movement, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think I, that I, that is a really good distinction because it also explains why, for example, spiritualism um, generally didn't create new church organizations, but right. when it did create organizations, it created things that called themselves churches and worshipped in kind of a, a vaguely, you know, Protestant Christian way. Um, right, they just happen to have ghost chatting right. going on, right. spirit talking. Right. Well, it is interesting, you know, so it develops, and so by what mid 1800s late 1800s you've got like uh, something that everybody knows now the talking board right uh, and this is where you really see the connection of spiritualism as parlor game because people are going to begin to gather and they are going to have séances in their homes 
They're going to be famous mediums. A medium is someone who claims to talk to spirits, for those who, who don't know. And so the Ouija board has its origins here. Um, they borrow from earlier esoteric and occultic things like scrying yeah. and automatic writing right. and things like that. Uh, so they take things that the church would have warned about, unless you're Queen Elizabeth, apparently. But <laughs> uh, first Queen Elizabeth, by the way. Uh, because the that's second a, one is just a demon, full stop. <laughs> anyway. Well, <clears throat> one man, reptile's a reptile's a reptile. I'm just saying. But uh, we should this do an not- episode on... <laughs> This is, this is not, not a monarchism rep- podcast. Sorry. It's not a, rep- a reptilian respecting <laughs> podcast either. Um, so we should do one on John D though. One day we should yeah. do a whole episode on John D just to see what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, um, so there, be- there are these very popular ways in which people are bringing this idea that the afterlife is just a spirit world. The whole idea that when you die, you see a bright light, like a train coming at you. That is sort of a, 19th century spiritist or spiritualist uh, way of conceptualizing the afterlife. Right. Um, everybody essentially becomes a ghost and they can be contacted. Right. And the idea that it's popular also explains its connection, at least doctrinally and, and often sociologically to things like Christian science or Christian science's predecessors um, in terms of what was called animal magnetism or sometimes faith healing, and uh, often a medium, uh, not the Fox sisters, but uh, a very famous one, Andrew Jackson Davis, did the whole range of these things. He produced these kind of quasi-theological treatises. He contacted the dead. He also engaged in faith healing. So a lot of these kind of outside, the, very outside the church, or at least quasi-outside the church, usually condemned by Orthodox churches, activities are all going to be interlinked. You don't really find people not doing them. And I mean, the Ouija board is just domesticating something that right. earlier you would have had to go to a seance to see a medium doing. And yeah, then, it's the Industrial Revolution yeah. version of devil worship, essentially. <laughs> it's the homogenization. Yeah. It's the craft foods of... Yeah. Of necromancy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because you don't, you know, you don't have to have like an artisan producing this, uh, producing contact. You yourself have within yourself what um, they still call um, in spiritualist organizations, the capacity of the, of mediumship. Everyone could be a medium. I mean, it, this is so American, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not just can you do this evil thing and we can sell it to you, but... <laughs> Any right. of you can do it. Want, want yeah. to talk to the dead? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, pull yourself up by your spirit life bootstraps. So, yeah, and um, very seductive movement, really, because it preys upon the grieving soul. Yeah, the person who's lost that loved one, they want to contact them, and this is the absolute state of Christianity at the time, because the Bible is very clear: don't talk to the dead. And they're not even clever about this. They're not even going to do like a pray to the saints, all are alive to God kind of thing. They're going to say, uh, whatever, you know, we're all, they they don't even care because it's, I mean, it's not Christian. So it's not an issue for them. They don't see this as sinful and they don't, even though there'll be warnings about abusing this or about malevolent entities, there's no real worry. No, no. And I mean, geographically, the same, <clears throat> the same area that's, that's not only the source of this, uh, the Fox sisters, a lot of these other social movements we mentioned, this is the same world in which among, for instance, Northern Baptists at this time, you already have debates about the inspiration of scripture. So yeah. churches are already being cut off at the knees as to their capacity to assert anything with divine authority on the basis of scripture. Well, this if is the same era yeah. that we have higher criticism. I mean, this is, right. I don't want to like, like bash Westcott and Hort, like a K- KJV only podcast, but you know, uh, this is a time where people are beginning really for the first time to doubt, not just the word of God, but the very, or, or right. the idea that the manuscripts they're based on are corrupt. Right. So they're not going to come right out and say, Oh, the Bible's corrupt. They're going to come out and say, Oh, you've been using bad manuscripts. So, so that even academically, they're starting to say, well, you might not really have this word here. Right. So, the, I mean, I, I, I see this age as in many ways, and 
and this was this is echoed in all sorts of things, popular literature, theological treatises, as in some ways very sick, not throughout the United States necessarily, but certainly in the Northeast, which is still an enormous proportion of the American population, right. that we, we're not even sure what the word of God is, let alone whether it condemns these things. All right. Well, let's... Uh... Where do we go from here then? It's beginning to grow big and where does it go? Yeah. I mean, I, I, your distinction between popular spiritualism and, you know, sort of intellectually justified is probably the next place to go because things like spiritism, which is a French codification with select canonical books by a man who took the name Alan Kardec uh, or theosophy under Madame Blavatsky or similar things. Those are rolling together spiritualism with an impulse toward Eastern thought that you find long before uh, the Civil War in people like the Transcendentalists. Yeah, I think it gives it a legitimacy that it was searching for, which is, um, I mean, something all religions want, but it gives it an alleged tie back to the past, to something deep, and therefore deep into the past means it's legitimate. Right. In a lot of people's thinking, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Right. Because if you take the rather crude idea that spirit is superior to matter and spirit is eternal and matter is passing, that's something that almost anyone can sort of grasp and probably is the default in most people's Protestantism. Nonetheless, that gets taken by intellectuals and rolled into concepts such as reincarnation, which is right. not yet in the 1870s, it will be by the 1970s, not yet uh, a common idea of which the average American would have heard. No, no, it's 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 the rare like European explorer who spends too much time in, in India. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the, they're, they're going to come up with intellectual justifications for how a spirit could come into someone or also to right. overcome the idea of because when Christians do respond, they'll say rather simply, yes, there is a spirit inside Charlotte Fox or inside Andrew Jackson Davis, but it is an evil spirit. Okay. Right. And reincarnation can, can get you around that if you have this kind of world framework where this spirit has now come into me for some beneficent purpose, right? It is inhabiting right. me. I am possessed. That's why I'm being so weird as I do this. But- it's because it's here with a message of universal peace or whatever the case may be. Right, right, yeah. Its intentions are good, so how can it be evil? <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, so many people have said. Right. So as it begins to develop, it falls prey to what every religion does, if given a long enough timeline, uh, institutionalism. <laughs> and so it's going to become institutionalized and, and picked up by celebrities. And so let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. Um, the institutionalization, you can actually go experience if you want to. Um, upstate New York is a place where you can find many monuments to the movements we, we mentioned earlier. Uh, so after your visit to the Hill Camorra, you're going to want to stop by a place called Lily Dale. Lily Dale is a town in which this is kind of probably the dream of many of the listeners. You have to be a member of a certain church to own property there. And <laughs> Lily Dale is a place where you have to be a member in good standing of a spiritualist church of some kind. And, but you can visit if you're not and, and stay at these really kind of charming, you know, Queen Anne Victorian uh, hotels that they have there. Yeah, like 150 bucks a night available right now at Kayak or <laughs> Priceline or right from Google if you want. Yeah, there you go. And so uh, you're going to go there and attend one of the daily services currently on Zoom, uh, um, as I've learned. Uh, but one of the daily services... <laughs> because you're all spirit, but we yeah, still don't want to We don't want to catch anything. If anybody was ready for internet communion, it was the spiritualists. <laughs> um, you know, we'll hand that to them. But um, you're going to go to the healing temple, and there you're going to get in contact with the spirits who inhabit the place, uh, spirits who have come back to to fill you as you develop your capacity for mediumship. Um, yeah, you can I, you can visit the Fox Sister Cabin there. You can visit a quaint old schoolhouse. It's it's isn't it so bizarre to think of schoolhouse mediumship? 
But there it is. I mean, because but there it there, is. Yeah. At one time, this was you know, and it, it, it's also interesting that these kind of these kind of forms of religion, and, and we'll talk in a little while about how this de- you know develops into things recognizable as new age in the 20th century. But things like this, I mean, there was a different demographic. I mean, even a spiritualist who would be in political terms, completely left wing in every way you could imagine in 1893, still had like four kids. So you can find (laughs) pictures. Was still appalled by things like adultery and uh, usury and everything. Right. right, Because people didn't do that, you know? Right. Um, Decent people live in a decent way. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Say what you will about spiritualism, but you know, so you can find pictures of, you know, their spiritualist Sunday school. It's, it's really kind of fascinating because they replicate so much about kind of Protestant America, but inform it with completely different doctrines. It really does well, yeah. resemble I mean, Mormonism. Well, that is why <laughs> um, that is why the modern version of this, like modern mediums, are just look like regular suburban dads or housewives. They do, yeah. And yeah. and it looks like uh, when when you go and meet with them, or when they have uh, their their gatherings, or their what do you want to call it, their readings it looks mm-hmm. like a some some suburban mom's book club right and and that's who's attracted to it too you yeah. know like um if you it, it, you know if the long island medium or something comes to your town you're going to see very average people you know maybe lwml members just standing waiting to get into the building and they are just livid that pastor schmidt would say don't go there <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, this idea that that your religion is kind of your personal project that you're developing is not a new idea. These folks in the 19th century really are just ahead of their time in the degree to which it is their their personal project, their personal journey of discovery, shall we say. Right. And at this point, you know, not our audience, but people might be picking this up from somewhere. They think they think they're clicking on the other word, fitly spoken. And so they're like, <laughs> they're going, well, well, what, well, what's wrong with this? Is is religion not a not a personal thing? Uh, yes and no. It, it is not. It is personal in that you must have your own relationship with Christ, but it is not personal in so far as um, you are free to develop your own system of thought, your own right. theology. There, there is only one truth, right? And that one truth has called you in a community of believers that believes that same truth, which we call the Church of Jesus Christ, and so. That's a very important thing to remember that just the word communion in general implies that we are all sharing the same beliefs. And every good religious organization would agree with that. 19th century spiritualists would actually want to be pretty uniform in the way they did things institutionally and organizationally. So at least they get that right. The problem is for the 19th century ones is they're deviating from, you know, the truth of God. <laughs> and the modern ones are uh, just doing what every other Christian religion began to do shortly after that and say, well, we can sort of do our own thing. We can tailor our own thing. This I'm going to stretch here, Adam, but Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. You know, when talking about the 20th century version of this, like, I mean, up into like the 1990s and really 2000s or 21st century where it's looking like suburban wine club stuff. It reminds me a little bit of Bill Hybels going around before he find, uh, founds his church and doing surveys on what you would want a church to look like. Mm-hmm. It strikes me as very much the same thing, to try to look like something very normal for the sake of reaching people. Right. Yeah. I'm, not saying Willow Cre- I'm not saying Willow Creek is sure. spiritualist. I'm not, right. But this, this kind of spirit of let's appear normal so that people will believe what we say is an interesting phenomenon to me. Yeah, yeah. Be- and if you look at um, cartoons or um, accusations made against spiritualists, the the accusations are are very are very similar to accusations against, especially megachurch pastors in the twentieth and twenty first centuries, right? Because from playing on people's emotions so directly and and almost uniquely to the exclusion of inculcating really hardly any doctrine, because the, the attraction to uh, sit here while Madame Blavatsky explicates like which, you know, spirit, capital S, visited her and, and what right. well, he and said. Like we talked about yeah. animal magnetism, which is just kind of this law of attraction. Right. You know, I'm trying to think of there was 
in the early 1900s, there's hundreds of books written with all these different titles, but it's all the same idea. Yep, yep, yep. That, that just believe hard enough, have enough positive energy, you'll bring it to you. That's right. Kissing cousin to spiritualism, spiritism, and theosophy. That's right. No, but, no, totally. And yeah, if these and, people, go ahead. Yeah, and it's but it's the same idea from these mega churches in many ways. Yeah, and if they were alive, I mean, if there were ebooks in the 19th century, they would have been written by you know, mesmeric healers, uh, and, and mediums, because it does inculcate the same idea that your heart's desires can be fulfilled. If you follow the teachings or buy the book or attend the reading. <laughs> yeah. These, person. these 10 principles, I mean, it's, it's yeah. not dissimilar in any way other than the quality of paper that it's printed on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean that, you know, this, and, and because of, you know, it, this is a free market in religion. These people can be as successful and as wealthy as 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 they want to be, really, um, because there will always be a fresh supply of dead people to be contacted. So that's that's how it takes off. the The institutions themselves never get nearly so big as something that is a lot more doctrinally demanding, like Mormonism. Yeah, I think that the uh, the in a very subtle way the ideology of spiritualism goes further than the institution does yeah. because people up to today still think of things in these terms as far as how they conceive of the afterlife. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the influence of them, especially on another institution that's going to blow up after the civil war called the Chautauqua also from Western New York uh, as an institution. And Teddy Roosevelt says there's nothing more American than a Chautauqua. <laughs> um, we'll have, we'll have revivalist Christian preachers. I mean, you know, actual Christian ministers, but it will also have all kinds of now forgotten characters, uh, who will lecture on things like what, what, what is now called the law of attraction. So all of this is mixed together and you're right that it survives long after anyone remembers who the Fox sisters were. Well, we've got to take our next break. We're going to be talking about Harry Houdini and Arthur Conan Doyle right after this here on A Work At Least Book. back, everyone. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Adam Coont. We're talking spiritualism, spiritism, and all wacky talking to the dead stuff in the 19th and 20th centuries in America and why we're in the state we're in today. Well, just before the break, um, I began to talk a little bit about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a famous creator of, of course, Sherlock Holmes and other things, uh, very much into spiritualism. Very uh, much into spiritualism. You know, um, we're not going to talk about the Cottingley fairies or anything like that today, although that would be fun. But he is it is it fair to say that I don't want to say he's not skeptical because he will claim to be um, very much empirical when it comes to supernatural things. But let's say he's a supernatural respecter. He's, he's a paranormal respecter. He is yeah. definitely a paranormal respecter. I mean, he probably. He probably would listen to this podcast if he had been alive to listen to podcasts. <laughs> right. <laughs> he might he might not have liked everything, but he would have he would have written letters to us. He would have been uh, yeah. He would have been an email to you know admin at wordfitly or podcast at wordfitly dot com. Yeah. yeah, he definitely would be in the in the Facebook group wordfitly posting and um, yeah, and it would be a mutual admiration society. I mean, I I love Sherlock Holmes. Well, speaking of uh, talking to the dead, I did, while we were recording, get a request from Alfred Raywinkle to join WordFitly Posting. So. <laughs> uh, people's sock accounts are, are getting wild these days. We, we love it. it automatic <laughs> approval. Uh, we will work on that. We will get you approved if you're not. Um, 
<laughs> so yeah, so let's talk about Arthur Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So he's yeah. going to be very much a celebrity endorsement for this kind of philosophy. Very much so. And because he is a member of a British group, because this obviously, things that happen either in the US or the UK always spread from one to the other relatively quickly. A British group called the Society for Psychical Research. And they're yeah. using the word psychical as in spiritual or soul-ish broadly, not as in merely psychological the way we think of it. And so that that society is going to research maybe chiefly mediumship, but also other things, which is where his interest in fairies and, and other intermediate beings uh, comes in. And it will be uh, ostensibly skeptical, but it, it will finally come down and he will certainly come down himself on the idea that the supernatural and uh, the reality of spiritual existence and of spirit possession, whatever the precise metaphysics of that are, those are all real things. These are not merely hoaxes, which will be the other popular option, uh, especially spread through the media in the United States through a group at the University of Pennsylvania called the Cybert Commission, who researched these things in the 1880s and say, it's all just fraud. It's sheer fraud. Yeah. which one of the Fox sisters will actually say is true in 1888 and then recant, and the other two never recant. So uh, in opposition to that option, saying none of this happened, none of this is real, nothing's going on, Doyle believed that these things were real. And even before, and this is important to note, before his son dies in the First World War. Okay. Right. Because a lot of people think he's just trying to talk to his son. He believes in these things before his son's death. Yeah, and we have teenage. writings uh, demonstrating yep. that. Yep. It, uh, he is friends with the most famous magician of all time, Harry Houdini. And this actually compromises his friendship with him because Houdini sets about to debunk spiritualism and mediumship. And he writes a book called A Magician Among the Spirits. And all about debunking, debunking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, he was. He was, he was a debunker. He was, he was your average, uh, you know, uh, pale of settlement debunker. Uh, yeah, and so say. everything for him is just borrowing from stage magic. Now, I, I think in large part he is correct here. A lot of what is going on is stage magic. Yeah. Um, you know, and even things like there was some, some something called spirit photography, where people would claim to take photos of ghosts. Right. And your your average. Uh, you know, person at that time doesn't care to know how photographs are made. And so he's demonstrating how the, like the go, you know, how the ghost of, you know, someone can be faked on, right. on film right. and things like that. Uh, right. He's, he's showing how some of the rapping noises were made and things like that. And this really drives a wedge between him and Doyle uh, Houdini. I mean, really has a, a grudge against these people. And he, he called what they did a uh, humbug which is, you know, a 19th century way of calling BS on something. Yeah, right. Uh, we should bring that word back. It's pretty cool. Uh, but that is what he called it. And this is kind of where the, uh, the discussion goes, where we would say, okay, do we accept that all of this necromancy is just parlor tricks, magic tricks, or is there an actual spiritual reality here that can be tapped into? And that's why God warns us about it. You know, God warns about using false measures which would be a trick, but he also warns about real spiritual dangers. Right. And, and Houdini doesn't believe in any of that, right? So it's not as right. if Conan Doyle was a Christian or something, but he is closer to the kingdom than someone like Houdini who flees into really just crass materialism. Well, he, and I can't remember, it's the book he wrote on superstition and he hires like H.P. Lovecraft to ghostwrite for him. Houdini, you know, where it's basically just debunking all miracles. I think there's, I mean, there's, if I'm not mistaken, and I, yeah, I know this, but there's, there's a, there's at least one other time where Houdini has Lovecraft write something for him, debunking something supernatural. So he, it's just this naturalist explanation of everything. Right. It's just disappointing that H.P. Lovecraft would be involved in that, you know. Well, well New, New England is going to New England. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, when the Yankee falls away from Christ, who he knows? He falls what, hard. He falls very <laughs> you know, hard. And deep. Yes. Yeah. But he cannot escape this idea that something is haunting him, whether that that is, you know, the, the elder ones 
or whether that is, you know, the, the spirit of the murdered peddler, something is coming for him. Right. I mean, it is interesting. The fiction of those who deny God is often much more horrible than the fiction of those who have God in their hearts. And maybe we should think about that when we pick up a fiction book to read. You know, what are you, what are you taking in? What, you know, what is this author putting out that you're going to imbibe by reading this? That, that is sort of a minor point, but it's something that um, Lewis brings up in his science fiction. Yeah. yeah. It is that the, the imagination of the modern man, because it has been trained by ungodly minds to conceive of evil, imagines far worse things than may actually even be yep. real. Absolutely. Um, man-made horrors beyond our comprehension. Yeah, there it is. Um, and people should realize that words spoken, written, words actualized become reality if we're not careful. Yeah. But that's a subject for another time. All right. Well, so you've got Houdini. You've got the uh, the very naturalistic way of looking at this. We're going yeah. to say that, no, it, it's it, yes, it can be just parlor tricks, but yeah. there also are times where this is a real spiritual entity being contacted, a real right. demonic entity, and therefore very dangerous for the Christian, for anyone. Right. Very dangerous for anyone to play around with. Right. And I, I mean, I would say that, you know, you can maybe suspect parlor tricks if you're dealing with a performer. Right. You should not, if you are engaged in a practice yourself. Yep. <laughs> that you know you're not, you know you're not making the table walk. Yep. You know you're not making the planchette move. Right. You know, you know that you're not doing this. So what is it? Is it, and the Houdini type will say, well, it's all just suggestion and you, you can suggest things to yourself, but but that's also just running away from God again. That's running away from a world that is very much real. Yeah. And I, I think that those, those um, suggestions only make sense to, you know, otherwise believing people because we have, if we don't have the same strict spirit matter distinction that say a 19th century Quaker might, we still nonetheless might suspect on a very basic level that somehow everything is psychological. And so if Houdini says, well, the effect that this had, or, you know, whatever, Carl, you know, he's kind of proto Carl Sagan or something at this point, you know, this is just your imagination. This is just your projection. If you're going to say that, then why don't you just say that the, you know, everything is psychological and God is a psychological projection. If you believe in the metaphysical reality of God, then you should certainly believe in the metaphysical reality of the rest of his creation and not just your own brain. Right. And we have to be careful too, but I don't want to get onto the psychologizing of everything. That's its own episode, but Lutherans are particularly uh, suggestible to that kind of idea. So we need to do a whole hour on that one day. Um, You know, from this kind of thing, we'll develop the uh, semi-legitimate fields of, you know, psychical research, like you talked about, but also um, parapsychology. Yeah. You know, men like William Roll, who are investigating poltergeist activity up in the 60s and 70s. He might still be alive. I don't know. Uh, but notable men who are making an academic study of the supernatural. Right. And it, sometimes a Christian forgets that there are other people uh, who believe in spirits. They just have a very different view of them. That at times we can get into this thinking that, well, there's Christians and there's atheists. Well, no, there's <laughs> yeah. supernatural believers are on a spectrum. And, and so you've got to be careful with that. And we got to make sure that we don't go off the rails and do another, into another uh, religion altogether. And, and that is beginning to happen to some Christians. So let's fast forward a little bit, if we can, mm-hmm. Adam, yeah. to uh, the modern version of this. We've already t- talked about it a little bit like Long Island Medium, yeah. John Edward, mm-hmm. which I mean, that show's got to be, is that going on 20 years old now? Do you remember That's John pretty Edward? Old. Yeah. That's pretty old. Um, and and yeah. very big in his time. And if you go to uh, Lily Dale sometime in the summer, um, or you go to Bethel Church in Redding, California, you will hear messages that will sound very similar to each other. They will draw on uh, the law of attraction, on new thought, on the spirit matter distinction and the superiority of affirmation over all things. And some of these things might feel just sort of like psychological tricks. So, you know, maybe you just don't focus on every bad thing that's happened and your life is going to go better. Sure. Okay. But a lot of it is drawing on 
things that over time have become, as you mentioned, um, in the case of theosophy, much more philosophically robust. And if you run into something like this, that is not just a Ouija board in someone's, you know, hall closet today, it's probably going to be shelved in Barnes and Noble or called or certainly adjacent to via YouTube algorithms to something that is new age, because we get a serious infusion of Eastern thought that's going to back up a lot of this such that if you encounter this today, it's going to be, it's going to attend popular ideas now very distant from kind of Protestant 19th century America about karma, about reincarnation, about affirmation. I mean, new age, esotericism, new age philosophy, new age symbolism even has creeped into regular society. I was in a church the other day, just looking at the plaques on the wall as one does. And they had it. What it was was a symbol for a prayer labyrinth. Do you remember yeah. this? Let's go mm-hmm. back to the nineties. Yep. Let's pretend we're Episcopalians in the nineties. Okay. And I the, mean, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is a, a believing church, uh, you know, on paper and, there's a picture of this labyrinth drawn for contemplation. I mean, just purely new age. Mm-hmm. I would argue demonic in its symbolism. Um, I, I don't have a problem with contemplative prayer necessarily when done in a biblical Christian kind of way. Yeah. But anytime you're drawing this this bizarro circular symbol, uh, what, what looks like a sigil, the sigil, um, then mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna back off a little bit. And this was in a church because we have lost a measure of discernment for what we bring in you know, the, the symbols that we use, the vocabulary that we use, like you're saying, like we don't, we won't say karma, but we'll say, well, they'll get what's coming to them, Mm -hmm. which is another way of saying that they don't mean that the righteous just judgment of God, they mean what they do is going to come back to haunt them. A force. Yeah. 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 And well, God is even treated that way. And and in modern charismatic circles, like you mentioned with Bethel, um, the Holy spirit is treated as that force where a new age person would call the force something else. Unfortunately, some Christian and named churches treat the Holy Spirit that way. Yeah, and I, I, this is I, I I don't really you know <laughs> uh, the 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 rumors of the dangers of like you know uh, people being encouraged to read the Bible have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, <laughs> however, the influences that flow into, for instance, a Lutheran church from a quote evangelical church at this point. Yeah. Are, are, are not in the nature of what they maybe used to be, um, where it would encourage our people maybe to go out for a, you know, concerned women of America rally or something. <laughs> right. It, it is in the nature of a doctrine of the Holy Spirit that honestly, if you know enough about Quakerism, looks a lot more like that than not only anything resembling uh, Lutheran theology, where it's yoked to God's word and what God's word authorizes in the sacraments. But it's not even the same twinning, if not yoking, that you get traditionally in evangelicalism, where if the spirit is mentioned, the Bible's not far behind, right? Right. So that's still not, that's not optimal, that's sub-biblical, but it's not anti-Christian. At this point, the spirit has this anti-Christian aura about him, and he becomes an excuse for really... Oh, you know, yeah. Anything. Well, God has put in my heart to leave my spouse or yeah, something right. like that. Exactly. Um, we and and they can do this even with the Bible. This Bible verse says to me that I should go do this. God is telling me through this verse to do this, as if there's not an objective meaning of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. as if there's not an audience, an original audience, or something like that. It's become, unfortunately, almost a magical book for some people, because we've confused God speaking to you through the Word with you know, God's kind of magic eight ball. That's what it becomes a little bit to where he, you know, this, this is going to sort of in a supernatural. See, I've got to be careful the way I put this. God will supernaturally convict you and communicate to you through the word, but not in the way you think. Right. Not in the way it's sometimes taught. You know, a, a, a Bible verse cannot mean something for you if it's completely divorced from its actual biblical meaning. Right. You just can't use it in that way. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so, but to go back to the original point of basically this idea is the spirit is there to, to guide you apart from the Bible. But what you really mean is the heart wants what it wants. And so God is going to give you those desires. That's right. Because 
when you think about the things that we've talked about, the the yearning to contact the dead, the the yearning to have mysteries resolved, you know, what happened to this peddler who disappeared in the neighborhood? Those are all things that are common in human beings, these different yearnings. But you need to look at things by their fruits. So the yes. fruits of this are that they divide churches, they lead people out of churches, they create things that are called church, but are in no recognizably doctrinal sense church. Okay. And so you look at things by their fruits and you observe what the fruit of thinking of contact with the supernatural as being a fulfillment of my desires or contact with the supernatural as being my explanation of how the Holy Spirit explained what I should do with my life apart from anything else or apart from God's church. Yeah. And it's you know, really that simple. Yeah. And kind of go back to square one here. We have a flawed pneumatology because it begins with a flawed anthropology. We're following after these internal desires and we're letting them lead us wherever we want to go. Right. So that on the one hand, you can say, I ha my heart is broken because I'm grieving for this person. Let me reach out to this medium to talk to them. Let me reach out to the dead or someone who claims to speak to the dead to try to contact them. Yeah. And then fast forward to kind of what we're talking about here now. Now my heart is leading me towards something sinful, but I believe it's God talking to it when it really it's just your own sin telling you or the devil whispering in your ear. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, you have to have you have to understand who you are as a fallen man and as a sinful man before you can begin to to trust those inward impulses. Right. Yeah. And that 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 capacity to discern the spirits is not just a, an admonition about other people or movements right. or pastors. It's also about oneself. And if you can't tell the difference between the old man and the new man, or you've been taught that only the old man is really operative in you, for example. Right. <laughs> Nobody would of, ever teach that yeah, implicitly right, or explicitly. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, but, you know, a hypothetical in-house heresy. If that's the case, then you have an incapacity to discern the spirits. You can't tell the difference between what is holy and what is unholy. And if you can't do that, then you will follow every deceitful spirit. And one way to recognize when deceitful spirits are being followed is not just by these variety of practices that just for no, you know, no particular reason always appear next to each other, taking people's money, lying, um, doing weird, wicked things, uh, writing as if you are under inspiration of the Holy Spirit about very specific things. That's going to appear from the Fox sisters down to Deepak Chopra. Um, right just watch what happens and when it happens learn to watch the same things in yourself so that you are not likewise deceived very well said well adam thank you so much always a my pleasure, pleasure. Yep. this has been a word fitly spoken if you like what you heard and want to know more check us out wordfitlyspoken.org facebook.com slash word fitly or twitter at word fitly i'm willie grills here with adam Coons. god love you and god bless Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Acts chapter 16, 16 to 18.